Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, those of you who were seeing for the first time today missed maybe the most energetic 8 a.m. session ever at a, a Saturday event, um, but we're really excited to keep that going for this 9 a.m. session um, on improving economic mobility through integrated services. I do want to remind folks before we get started that, that as you should have all just heard, we are in fact recording at the moment, so please keep that in mind. These recordings will be available at the end of the week as well. So if there's material you want to review, you will have these to go back to. Um, Jess and Justin, I'll introduce you briefly in a moment. It's so nice to have you here with us this morning, especially if you are sharing materials and things like that. I will, I'm happy to help monitor the chat so that as questions are coming in, we'll make sure that you have access to those. Um, what that means for participants is if there are thoughts, ideas, questions that are coming up for you during the presentation, please do not hesitate to put those in the chat and we'll kind of build a really robust discussion from there. So with that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce Justin Gandy and Jess Carey. Justin um, is the Deputy Director with IRC Richmond um, and uh, has um, over 14 years of experience in refugee resettlement and just joined the IRC um, as an Economic Empowerment Specialist in 2020 um, and oversees the IRC Richmond's Early Employment, Career Development, and Financial Capability Programs. And I will turn it over to the two of you. Thank you, Katie. And I'm I'm impressed uh, that there was a session before this session. Uh, so I have three kids at home. I struggled just to get here by nine. So I appreciate everybody making time and the dedication uh, to these topics and to the community to, to make time on a Saturday. So very impressive. And, and thank you for Katie and um, all the facilitation that's gone into it. Um, so yeah, we know, you know, we, we wanted to have a discussion and a little bit of an update on some IRC programming, uh, but not, not necessarily just to share what IRC is doing, but also how it relates to uh, individuals in the community, people that you may be connected to that could use support. And so we really want to spend more time focusing on how to get people connected to these programs and some of these uh, services that that are tangibly beneficial to to families um, in the community. Um, Jess, do you want to run the slides? Yeah, I'll run share my screen. Let me know when you're able to. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Right. So, so IRC, you know, we, we provide resettlement services. Um, we know, you know, clients are arriving here with, uh, you can go to the next slide, um, with different needs and different barriers, et cetera. So for today, you know, the anticipated sort of conversation and the, and the outcomes are to help understand uh, the barriers to economic mobility. Um, and to understand the benefit and impact of what we refer to as, as integrated services or bundled services, um, and to talk a little bit more about the financial capability services that IRC is able to provide to uh, not just refugees, but to, to a, a large number of uh, families and, and communities in the Richmond area. Uh, but like I said, to really uh, understand how you can connect uh, families that you're working with that need support uh, for things like financial products uh, that are safe and, and not predatory, um, financial education, et cetera. So we're happy to, to spend some time. I uh, want to make, make certain that we have time for, for questions at the, at the end so we can answer anything and, and talk about those referral pathways. Uh, next slide. So if you've spent any time volunteering or working uh, with, you know, newcomers or refugees or SIVs in the community, you know that there are barriers to their uh, economic well-being, right? Um, nearly 70% of the foreign-born population in the U.S. hold jobs. Uh, that's a higher rate than native-born population, uh, yet their poverty rates are substantially higher, 20% plus. Um, and the median income household of immigrant families is as less is more than 12% below native-born families. Um, so for those of you that are volunteers that, that have spent time working with families, um, if you can, you know, what, what are some of the, the types of barriers that, that uh, clients face uh, regarding their income, financial health, economic mobility? Feel free to unmute or, or throw those in the chat. 
Is there anything that you've seen with with individuals that you're working with? I see childcare can't work if they can't find someone to watch kids. Yes, complex licensure, be to it. Language, transportation, right? These are these are things that that are substantial barriers, not to just finding your first job, but to understand how to go from surviving to building assets, right? Uh, digital literacy, uh, a huge problem, uh, especially over the last few years. It's it's done nothing but increase language barrier visas. Um, I'm seeing some some support with uh, with childcare, re reiterating those pieces. Um, so yeah, Jess, we can bump to the next slide. So many of the barriers faced, you know, in the refugee immigrant community, newcomers, are common to a lot of low uh, socioeconomic, just native born families, things that were, they're struggling with, with financial education, access to childcare and other supports, um, for the resettlement community, you know, the, the resettlement timeline is very short. Uh, the amount of financial, uh, support that is given to families as they arrive is, is very short. And so, you know, their trajectory is often to land, get oriented as much as possible, and then somebody in the family just has to start working because rent is due, uh, these timetables are short, uh, they need to put out that initial financial fire. Um, so that is the most pressing and immediate need. And then, you know, there's all these barriers apply to initial job placement. Um, but when we think of going from just initial job placement to economic mobility, you know, building up um, some savings, you know, uh, acquiring assets. These things are substantial barriers. Um, so, you know, individuals arrive to Richmond with no credit history. Um, so they're limited and, you know, what types of financial products they can get. They're met with high housing costs, uh, which has only gotten worse um, in the Richmond community and nationwide. Um, there's a housing shortage um, and definitely an affordability crisis. Um, somebody mentioned in the chat licensure requirements. So let's say you are a dentist or a, uh, a nurse overseas uh, and you arrive to Richmond and you are skilled, you are an expert in your field, um, but you are you know, you are stuck working um, at a warehouse making, you know, $17 an hour because the licensure requirements to practice your field of work in the United States are restrictive. Um, they are time intensive and extremely difficult to navigate. Um, and also, you know, thinking of that, a lot of employers, despite your background, despite your overseas education, want to see a U.S. work history. They want to see you applying those skills in the American workplace. So that's a challenge as well. Um, and then when we think of digital literacy, I think of just overall financial education, financial literacy, familiarity with the U.S. system of finances. Um, so how to open accounts, how to, you know, which different types of accounts to hold, how to maximize those benefits, etc. Um, and, you know, with language access, just being able to go to a bank and open an account um, with differing documentation and what's required. Um, and then many of the, the ones that were highlighted, you know, child care, um, even for a two, you know, two uh, parent household is a challenge, um, but especially critical for for single parent families, um, having access to, you know, the benefits and the resources needed are, are substantially uh, challenging for all of the families uh, that we work with and that you are likely engaged with uh, in your in your volunteer efforts. Um, yeah. So going to the next slide. So when we when we think of all of these different challenges, these needs for um, you know understanding the financial uh, landscape, uh, banks, different accounts, um, we understand you know the licensure requirements. So all these different things that all need to be addressed. Um, how do we how do we address all things? as simultaneously as possible to help people, you know, move out of, you know, low wage poverty jobs um, and into more of a thriving position. Um, 
a job itself is is not enough to escape and stay out of poverty. There's millions of families across the United States who are working extremely hard, but that in and of itself is usually not sufficient to really move the needle and get people into a much healthier position with their financial lives. Um, so one thing that IRC has been doing locally and, and sort of based on work uh, across our network, uh, but something that's a big priority for us is what, we're, what we sort of refer to, refer to within our economic empowerment programs as integrated services. Um, and one of these is sort of the linchpin that, that holds it all together and is, is a newer initiative for us. Um, so this model um, is based on work done by the Annie E. Casey Foundation years ago, um, and they sort of put these three pillars together under uh, a model that they called the Working Families Success Model. It was not limited to, to refugees or immigrant communities. This is just more broadly thinking of working families and what they need to, to move the, the needle. Um, so this combination of these three key pillars um, it integrated as seamlessly as possible, and, and if, if at all possible, in sort of a one-stop shop setting, uh, are shown to have substantial impacts to, to, to families. So workforce development, so helping people uh, navigate uh, the workforce, get jobs that are meaningful, provide living wages, and provide some uh, career mobility, career laddering opportunities, helping them navigate licensure requirements, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, ensuring that clients that need support and need resources have access to the benefits that they are entitled to. Things like child care support from the VIEW program of DSS. Things like um, you know, TANF if, if there's no income coming into the family. Um, so while we're working to connect them to meaningful employment, we're also at the same time making sure that they have access and supports that they are entitled to and need to really be able to make a difference uh, financially. And then the newer initiative for, for the IRC Richmond office is what we refer to as financial capabilities. So financial capabilities is uh, sort of a broader concept, but really what it is, is it's, it's, addressing people's need for understanding the American landscape. So understand the, the, the knowledge and the skills uh, that are necessary, but also ensuring that they have uh, the motivation and the follow through uh, to act on the knowledge that they're receiving. It's one thing to you know, sit through an orientation and learn what financial literacy is and understand, oh, I should be putting, you know, I should have a savings account X, Y, Z, but it's different when you have all these combined barriers and all these different fires that you have to put out your kid gets sick and you have to go to the doctor your car breaks down etc so it, it's harder to just take our knowledge I, I i'm a perfect example of my own life i know all these things but me actually putting them into place uh when i maybe not the most disciplined individual on a you know on the, on the weekend where i don't want to get up and do xyz um but you know providing some coaching uh, behind the knowledge and the skills um, to to help you know clients set meaningful goals that that make sense for them and their families and have somebody checking in with them to motivate them and just uh, help with follow ups on different uh, needs and activities that were planned etc. Um, so it's 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 a combination of education skill building. Uh, but the motivation and the follow through uh, that is needed when you're navigating a complex system with all these you know, contributing factors. Um, in addition to you know, the financial education and coaching, uh, one thing that Jess is going to share a bit more about is the tailored financial products. So our clients arrive um, to Richmond and Things like transportation are a massive barrier to getting meaningful employment. So sometimes people are motivated to take out a loan, the first loan that they can come across because they have limited credit, limited work history. Um, that opens them up to things like predatory lending. We've seen car loans come through our office, 20, 30 percent interest, um, you know, things that clients feel that are critical and necessary for them to do but really have a negative impact um, 
for their financial well, uh, health and, and being able to put things together uh, and, and, and achieve a better sort of economic well-being, right? Um, yeah, Jess, go ahead. So based on research from, from, from IRC, you know, we do have this sort of service delivery model in multiple of our offices, but also going back to the Andy E. Casey Foundation uh, and things like LISC uh, Financial Opportunity Centers, there is a wealth of research um, and evidence that supports this and really highlights the benefits of this model, right? Um, you can imagine if you can go to one place and have all these services delivered together where the teams are talking and coordinating the services and you have somebody proactively reaching out to you, what a substantial difference that is than trying to navigate a very bureaucratic system across multiple locations, et cetera. So research has seen, and, and these are some just quick numbers that I pulled, um, we can share more research uh, with participants after or in the chat uh, in just a moment, but you know there are substantial increases in wage-based income so just the money that you are able to earn in your job um, increases when you have the supports, when you have uh, an employment specialist helping you to uh, advocate for higher raises or move, in, move laterally into a different job that pays better and is more accessible to you and can provide you more hours, etc. Um, when, we, when we take refugee families specifically, thinking about IRC, they arrive with zero credit but they arrive with a loan to repay at the same time. So our clients uh, 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 arrive to US with zero credit history, but refugees are obligated to repay their travel costs to the United States in the form of a, of a 0% loan. So within six months of arrival to the United States, they're already having to establish credit, right? So they're going from, from no credit to having a financial burden um, with, with no other sort of positive credit notes, right? So we help clients uh, to establish credit and to utilize it effectively. But what we've seen in very short form is, is clients that go from zero uh, credit history can go to you know, 650, 700 very quickly. And that has substantial impacts uh, across the board when you think about taking out auto loans, not paying deposits for utilities, other things like that, um, which has very tangible and impactful um, effects on, on families that are lower in the socioeconomic ranges, right? Um, so uh, yeah, and then and, and just thinking of the total services is um, interesting a lot, interestingly, um, you know, just having a financial coach and having support um, just increases your job placement rates and your ability, uh, it, 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 it seems very, uh, logical, <laughs> your ability to stay in that job for longer, right? If you have transportation and if you have somebody making sure you have access to, you know, uh, childcare, you don't have to leave work to go, you know, uh, to go home and juggle kids' schedules, et cetera. It improves all of these things across the board. Um, there's there's more categories we could have gone into, but in the interest of time, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but there are uh, a number of benefits across many outcome areas uh, that we could go into. So Jess, next slide. So on this slide, what you'll see, this is from IRC's, uh, one of our initial reports on financial capabilities to new Americans. Um, but these are for, um, for individuals who have accessed auto loans uh, through our Center for Economic Opportunity. You'll see that they're just being able to auto to access a low cost auto loan not only gets you a car that you need to get around and take your kids to school, et cetera, but it increases your, your wage base income. You can get to work, you can work more hours, you can do things more efficiently, you can get further um, out of your neighborhood into higher paying jobs, et cetera. So there's the benefit of avoiding predatory loans that have high costs, but also you know, the increase in your own in your in your in your income to your family. So next slide. And this is one thing, I'll, uh, this is sort of my last point before I turn it over to Jess to walk through the individual services and how to refer. But, you know, the key point being and something we're really excited about that I hope all of you, if you're working with families, will, will refer them to us if they need support is the financial coaching piece. So IRC has always, you know, helped people apply for benefits and we've helped find jobs. Um, 
But the financial coaching piece, this proactive sort of client driven model where they are uh, not mandated, but they are able to set their own goals um, and we are able to follow up with them consistently in a coaching model. Um, for, for individuals that engage in that coaching service, um, you'll see that their incomes, their, their outcomes are higher. And the longer that they are engaged, the more sessions that they go through with a financial coach, uh, you'll see that uh, that has sort of an exponential impact on different categories, monthly income, wage-based income. But obviously you'll see on the right, for families that are engaged in coaching sessions sort of longer term, seven months, 12 months plus, that lasting impact, that, that key takeaway over time is an overall a substantial increase in their net worth. So they're connected to public supports as they're eligible and need. Uh, they're connected to appropriate uh, financial products. Uh, they're able to get to meaningful employment and we're assisting them in mobility into higher more career oriented uh, types of positions. That all adds up over this time with this proactive follow-up um, to really help them get out of sort of low wage um, sort of poverty cycles um, the longer that they engage in those services. So it's really exciting. Um, Jessica, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more, but we've added two financial coaches to our office and we're really building out our economic empowerment programs to hold these three pillars uh, sort of intentionally um, and just to really be mindful of how we deliver these services and bring folks into it. So um, I hope for, for the folks on this call, uh, this was helpful to sort of understand the logic behind it. Um, and Jess will talk about the individual services and how to connect families in the community to this and what the eligibility is, because it's not just your typical IRC client, which is exciting. So Jess, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Um, so just to start off um, to talk about what programs are available at IRC under economic empowerment, um, we sort of have these four categories that are working together. So if you're envisioning the same, you know, arrows going into each of the circles, the, the graphic from before, um, this is where we're at within our office um, and providing integrated bundled services. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of these. And if you know, most of you are likely very familiar with these programs, um, but we, we first engage clients through early employment. Um, so we have employment specialists uh, who are able to support clients for five years post arrival through that program. Um, we have a couple of programs initially that people can enroll into. And then we have a career development specialist who started back in the fall um, to provide advanced JRT, career coaching, access to training. Um, and there's a note about education and training loans there that we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, benefits navigation right now through the RNP program. Um, and in the future, this will ideally be ongoing support that we're able to provide clients that are returning for services. Um, again, in a bundled services model that ultimately also points to financial capabilities to provide ongoing financial literacy training, education, you know, support with banking access, financial coaching, and our loan program. Um, also, feel free to, oh, and my little magnifying glass. Um, so we're focusing on financial capabilities today. Um, so just to give you sort of a little bit of history, um, the financial or FinCap program that we call it um, launched in January of 2021. It was the pilot program um, while I was an AmeriCorps member with IRC. So since then, we've had approximately, um, I think I need to update these numbers a little bit, uh, but 94 clients that have been enrolled into the financial capabilities program in Richmond specifically. Um, we've had 57 loans dispersed, totaling a little over $38,000, um, and we have had zero clients default on their loans, which is really exciting. So clients are able to repay those loans, um, and it's positively contributing to their ability to go to work um, and just generally have greater accessibility um, and build credit. 
So for 2023, some of our goals is to conduct outreach to at least 200 eligible clients, um, mostly newly arrived clients, and to provide ongoing workshops and training to at least 160 adults that would be participating in RNP and early empl employment programming. Um, we would like to at least uh, connect with 60 clients to provide financial coaching. And then our target is sort of 58 loan disbursements. Um, and then as Justin mentioned, we have two um, coaches. So one will primarily be providing support to newly arrived clients that are preparing to repay their IOM loan um, that Justin mentioned uh, briefly. And then the other, um, we'll provide sort of wider services through this program to provide coaching and access to the microloan program that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so first on financial coaching, I'm, I'm curious um, if anybody has heard of financial coaching, are you familiar with this model? I can't see the chat, so feel free to unmute if you need to. Is this new information? I'm getting a yes in the chat. I'm looking to see if anything else is coming through, Jess. Well, um, so the financial coaching model really starts with the rec recognition. It's really early. Well, I don't know how you made it to an 8 a.m. session. Um, <laughs> I'm like chugging my coffee here. But um, so recognizing that people are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. Um, so with this model and with financial capabilities programming, it's really centered on a client-led approach that focuses on understanding the values that underpin the decisions that they're making financially um, and, and other parts of life. So using that values-based approach, um, a coach and a client will work together to set mutually agreed upon goals, um, and then create, you know, a plan to reach those goals. So the role of a coach is really not to, um, you know, like tell a client what to do. It's in other parts of resettlement um, with the short timeframes that we have and limited um, funding and things like that, it can feel a little less um, like a partnership in some ways, although we're certainly, you know, aiming for a partnership in employment services and other things. Um, but this is really a program that allows clients to take the lead and identify where they want to go. Um, so through this program or through financial coaching, there's one-on-one -on -one financial coaching sessions, um, as well as financial literacy trainings. Um, it can focus on building credit, managing debt or credit recovery, um, providing budgeting support, access to banking, you know, creating a savings goal, opening a savings account, um, or opening credit accounts through secured credit cards, um, and then, of course, CEO loan products. Um, so to provide a little bit more information about CEO. Um, CEO stands for the Center for Economic Opportunity. CEO is a certified CDFI, um, which stands for Community Development Finance Institution. They function as a separate nonprofit organization, but they're also a subsidiary of the IRC. And they offer financial products that are accessible to folks that have historically had limited access to traditional financing. So these products are offered in tandem with financial coaching from partner organizations like IRC and Richmond. Um, CEO launched in 2015, and they were really just continuing the work of IRC. Um, IRC started lending around 2003, and this was a more formal initiative um, to create products that, that were accessible and affordable. So um, on that note, CEO is, you know, it, they aim to be the friendliest lender in town. Um, if clients lose their job, 
if their car breaks down, if there's some sort of bump in the road um, and they need to pause their repayments or they need to you know, skip a month, um, really clients are able to communicate that and CEO will accommodate and support the client and getting to where they need to be. And then at that point, we would sort of re-enter into employment services or, or other services at IRC in that bundled service model um, to provide more support. Um, and then CEO's aim, which I mentioned before, is really to bridge the gap in accessibility to financing that newcomers and low-income families generally within the United States have been prevented from accessing, either due to lack of credit history, limited income, you know, limited savings for a down payment on a car or a home. Um, and then CEO has developed about 30 partners across 18 states now, um, and they've served over 6,000 clients across those states, um, originating or arriving from over 100 countries, including the United States. So in thinking of bundled or integrated services, um, if you look on the right, these are some of the loan products offered through the CEO microloan program. And then if you look on the left, those are some of the programs that we already have um, at IRC. So within our workforce development programs, um, education and auto loans can help support a client's ability to access ongoing education and training to ultimately get a job and a career that they would like to work in, um, along with that career coaching and, um, and the support of our career development specialist. Auto loans are able to support clients both in early employment and in career development. Um, the one thing that we don't currently have in Richmond that is on this slide is business loans. Um, so ideally in the future, we will, um, once we have a technical advisor to provide support for clients who want to open small businesses. Um, so to be determined, maybe we'll present in a couple of years and we can tell you all about business loans at IRC Richmond. Um, within our financial capabilities program, we're really focused on credit building and getting people established in the United States. Um, the note on emergency loans refers to CEO sort of creatively responds in different ways based on what's happening in our general context. So during you know, the early days of the pandemic, a COVID response um, loan was created to support families that really just needed a, a lump sum of money at 0% interest in a pinch that they didn't have to pay back right away. Um, that loan is no longer available. Um, but then the safe loan program, which we'll talk about momentarily, also emerged out of the evacuation out of Afghanistan and the APA um, program that emerged out of that. So everything is sort of flexible and um, evolving with CEO to respond to client needs as they change. And then lastly, um, we do have immigration loans that clients can access when referred by immigration services. So there's two loans that we're really gonna focus on today um, because these are the most popular ones that we have. So the first um, is our credit building ladder loans. These are 0% loans that are open to literally anyone. So your next door neighbor who was born in the United States, or um, if somebody is undocumented or if they're currently seeking asylum, they're still eligible for these loans, um, which is unique because a lot of our programs require certain um, you know, arrival dates and statuses um, based on ORR eligibility requirements. So this is wide open. Anybody can be referred. And the goal is that this helps build credit. Um, so 
you have to sort of take the steps in order. The first loan is $100. You pay it back over six months. There's no hidden fees. There are no penalties. Um, ideally, a client or a borrower would be in communication with their financial coach to avoid any default on the loan. Um, but you just need a valid ID from any government that is not expired, a personal email address, a US bank account, and anybody who applies will get an automatic approval. This is a great program. Um, so the first financial coach that I mentioned earlier will really be focused on IOM lo loan repayments and also credit building. And then to switch over to auto loans, um, Eligibility requirements would be similar to the credit building loans, but also clients would need earned income, a valid driver's license, um, and would need to complete a budget with their financial coach reflecting their ability to pay back the cost of a loan, along with full coverage insurance and you know, the cost of gas um, and any other taxes, you know, planning for repairs, things like that. Um, this loan, the maximum amount that can be borrowed is $20,000. It's repaid max at a max term of 72 months. And then the interest rate is a range. And this depends on if there's already pre-established credit history, if clients are able to provide a down payment for the vehicle that they're purchasing and other factors. Um, there's a closing fee, so it's 2% or $75, whichever is less. And then the safe auto loan program that many of you may have heard of, um, again, was out of, uh, it was a response to Operation Allies Welcome or the evacuation out of Afghanistan that started in July of 2021. So for any Afghan arrival, mostly humanitarian parolees, but this could include others, um, that arrived between July 31st of 2021 and September 30th of 2022 would be eligible for this program. And it offers auto loans at a reduced interest rate. And again, it's a range and that is based on down payment percentage. Um, these loans were previously 0%, um, but there was an overwhelming response to 0% interest loans, as you can imagine. Um, and so these were no longer able to be offered at 0% starting in the spring of 2022. Um, this loan is available for the next two years to this population. So you're still welcome to refer clients for this loan product if they are eligible. So if you want to know more about CEO, the SAFE program, generally the loans that we offer, so those were just two, um, so there are more, then there is this sort of resource page that um, you're welcome to access. And then it also pro provides a link to our external referral form, and there's a QR code here on the side as well. So if you have a client that you're working with um, that you would like to refer for any of our services, then this would be the best way to do it. So I'm gonna see if it will let me click on it and still share my screen. So let me know if I would. Yeah, we can see the form now. Great. So clients are also, able to self-refer, there should be, I don't know if I'm seeing the best um, vantage point um, that you all might see. I'm still logged into Microsoft here, but there are different language options. Um, so Persian, Arabic, French, Spanish, Ukrainian, and Russian are the ones that are available right now. So clients are still are able to access this form and refer themselves as well. Um, but it just request for information, client information, if they are currently or have ever been an IRC client, their immigration status, arrival date, contact information, language needs, services requested. Um, we do request that you have consent from the client before referring them. So there's a question there. 
um, preferred method of contact, and then any other information that would be helpful for us to know about before contacting the client. Um, let's see if I uh, know how to jump back to the different screen. I don't. Um, one moment. All right, um, so uh, two other things to note. Um, the first is CEO did provide a report that has a lot of information that could be really helpful to review, which is also linked here. Um, and going back to those barriers that clients often face, um, one of them is, is cultural barriers. So a lot of our clients um, are not able to accumulate interest or pay interest on a loan. So to accommodate that, the CEO has created a fee-based loan product. So there's more information um, down here as well. So once you get the slide, feel free to check that out. And then if you all have questions now, or if you have them later, um, we'd be happy to follow up with you all. So thank you. Um, any key takeaways that you all would like to share or questions that you have? And Justin, if there's anything to add, feel free. Mm -hmm. I did have one question for you. Maybe I'm setting you up to share something. I don't know. Um, but I noticed on the referral form, it asks for things like date of arrival and date of birth. What if a volunteer doesn't have that information and they want to refer somebody? Why Why? why do you need that? And can they refer without that? What, which, what would you recommend they do? Oh no, you froze. I think you might have been frozen, oh. but I think I got your question. Uh, no. I don't know. It's saying my internet connection is unstable, so it might be. Um, yes. So I think um, it is really important that clients are aware of what they're being referred to. Financial coaching centers on clients taking the initiative and and leading the whole process. So I would encourage anybody who's referring a client to ask them their date of arrival and date of birth um, so that we can have the best information to contact the client. Um, there are a lot of clients with similar names. So having a date of arrival and a date of birth can really help us make sure that we're contacting the right person as well. So um, if it's just a barrier to referrals, I'm happy to readjust our form in the future but for now would encourage sort of intentional conversations to make sure that clients are wanting services. And then I do see, oh, I'm sorry, Katie. Oh no, please, Jeff. No, I was gonna say, um, Kate Ayers from RER has a question in the chat. Can you clarify or remind us of which programs are open to non-refugee, non-Afghan, non-SIV? So the eligibility buckets for each of these. Yeah, um, so the only thing that is specific for Afghan um, APA arrivals, I guess, would be the safe loan product, but everything else is wide open to anyone. Um, we certainly prefer to work with clients that we're connected with and other programs um, because the goal of this program is to set clients up for success. So if we have somebody who sort of randomly comes in and asks for a loan, um, I would be hesitant to just give them a loan because I want to make sure that it's going to build their credit and it's not gonna ultimately harm them financially. I don't think I answered your question though. So, I mean, it, there, it's really wide open. So any loan product is available for refugee clients. Um, for non-refugee clients who might be seeking asylum, the credit building loan program and financial coaching would be available. The other loan products, it sort of just depends on that client situation. Did I answer your question? Yeah, Kate says yes. Uh, so Rosemary has a question. Does the IRC in Charlottesville have this program? If not, are folks living in Richmond able to apply to these uh, loans and programs? Um, IRC in Charlottesville does have this program. However, we are able to serve 
all of Virginia with this program. So we would try to connect people to Charlottesville if they were closer, um, but we can across agencies, if another office does not have this program, we're able to serve them. And just does the Charlottesville office have the small business loan or is that across Virginia that's not in place yet? We currently only have four IRC offices that offer that. Um, so Atlanta, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, and I believe Sacramento. Um, it's one of the California offices. Uh, it feels like a foreign place to me. Um, so they are not currently available in Charlottesville, unfortunately. But they will be in the future. And while folks are still thinking of other questions and takeaways that they might put in the chat or feel free to obviously unmute yourself and jump in, um, I'd love to ask one, Justin, about something that you were discussing and just that you picked up on. Um, so I think this is sort of a takeaway that morphs into a question for me, but I, I knew a little bit about the IOM loans mm -hmm. before, but I don't think I'd stop to really understand what that would mean for someone's credit history. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered if you would talk a bit about whether the repayment process helps build some of that credit history that folks need. I understand that there are some really important reasons for the IOM loan, but I also wonder kind of what the debate and discourse around that looks like. And I'd love to know a little bit more about sort of how how that loan is being talked about currently. It'd be really interesting to hear your perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I would say that this is, this will be shifting starting like in March in our office, which is really exciting. Um, so IOM loans can help somebody build their credit. It's a 0% interest loan. So if clients are repaying that loan, it can positively help them build their credit history in the United States, but it can also hurt their credit history if they don't repay that loan. Um, so the, the role of our first financial coach is to provide education and sort of proactively talk to clients about repaying that loan. And I've had a lot of clients that pay it off like very quickly in one lump sum. So part of that conversation is making those rhythmic payments since it is a 0% loan to really build their credit um, because the repayment history is what will positively contribute to that rather than just paying it off um, altogether. And then Justin, if you have more information about sort of the conversation around those loans. Feel free to um, jump in. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. I was I was answering uh, a private question in the chat. Um, so to clarify for everybody, yes, non-immigrants are eligible for these loans. So feel free to refer. We will reach out and um, go through the, the the documentation sort of intake process for those. But non non-immigrants are are eligible for those. Um, Sorry, getting back to the IOM loan question. Um, Katie, can you clarify a little bit more about your question? Like, you want me to explain what the loan is, what the repayment is? I'm sorry, I missed some of that. While oh, no, that's sorry. okay. I, and just answered sort of the practicalities of it. I um, I think the second part of the question was just if they're, if this feels like a program that is established enough at this point that it's just going to continue, or if it's sort of um, a space that there's some ongoing debate or discussion about sort of the practicality of a loan for for folks who are trying to um, uh, come to this country? So the IOM loan is, is that is through the International Organization for Migration. So that's sort of an external, much larger picture kind of question. Um, I don't have any indication that that loan is going to go away. Um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I think it's a good advocacy point, um, but, I, I don't believe that there's current conversation to, to move away from it. Um, and IOM is, is the UN agency that, that sort of arranges transportation to all sort of tertiary countries. So it's not just the the U, the US that would be involved in that conversation. Um, I suppose it could, but then, you know, if it was just the US, we would have to figure out how to sort of absorb that cost into the program itself, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I, folks are always surprised to hear that, you know, hey, this Congolese family of seven, they're here, they're paying, they're paying for all of their costs, like this, this sort of myth that, 
you know, it's just like this gravy train of, of free things is from day one, you know, they're starting out in debt to get to a safe country. And so it's it's really interesting to see when people hear that sort of the reaction to it. Um, but as far as changes to the U.S. refugee admission program, I don't, I have not heard of any indication under the current administration. There have been large scale programmatic changes to resettlement, but I, that, I haven't heard that raised um, at this time. So I think it'll, for the, at least for the time being will remain sort of the model to get people uh, over here that's hugely helpful yeah just have the context for that is so yeah. um so useful thank you mm -hmm. are there other questions that are coming up for folks again feel free to unmute yourself or stick anything you'd like in the chat And Justin, Justin, is there anything that we haven't asked you yet that you you wish we would? Things that are still, that was such a really comprehensive presentation of so many amazing yeah. resources to tackle. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing, nothing in particular. I mean, we're, we're, we're extremely excited to be able to offer these services, sort of more longitudinal support to families that have arrived through the IRC or through CCC, uh, folks that are already in the community. We're also very excited to open our doors a bit wider and provide some of these benefits and services to non-refugee families as mm -hmm. well, which is something that we are sort of considering in our in our next steps as an organization. Um, I think one of the reasons we're most excited is because, I mean, we all know resettlement is a very mandated prescribed service as Jess was was alluding to. You know, we we have a very long list of rules and timetables to follow um, down to the number of forks that have to be in people's homes when they move in, et cetera. So this is an opportunity for us, and it's it's very exciting to sort of shift that paradigm and have it be more of a mutual conversation about what are the next steps for you? What where do you want to go? Or, you know, you know, your kid is, you know, your kid is 15, maybe you're maybe you're already thinking about university for for them as many of our families are that's one of the first things that we hear most people are here for the children they want their children to be in a safe space and get the education that they deserve etc so how can we how can we have that conversation how can we look at what your goals are where are your what is your starting point and there's not a sort of prescription of you should go this direction. That's the key difference on the coaching piece of it is we're sort of now in a position to have a conversation, not just, hey, look, you really need to start work because <laughs> rent is due. Uh, it's what, where do you want to go? Like what, like what does the future entail for you? And it's really exciting for us uh, as, as an agency that has to, to navigate these mandates and sort of balance and, and provide you know, meaningful, holistic, and client-centered services in that atmosphere. It's it's a really good opportunity for us to step away and really spend time, you know, helping families think through and, and develop their pathways um, based on their own values, based on their own desires, right? Um, so it's it's a really exciting opportunity. And, you know, if anybody were to click through like the CEO reports or maybe Google the Annie Casey, you know, models, et cetera, there's, there's a whole, you know, host of evidence as to, you know, why this is a good model. Um, but ultimately I think, you know, as evidence in the chat, we all know what the barriers are. So how are we meaningfully, you know, coming around those? How are we, you know, addressing all of these, you know, sort of coalescing challenges um, in a meaningful way, but but puts the client, puts the family in the driver's seat to say, no, nah, I, I, I don't want to continue down this vocational path. I want to return to, you know, uh, nursing or I, I want to return to, you know, uh, you know, uh, engineering, and and it really puts them and allows them, you know, this uh, autonomy and, and sort of self determination that they are obviously, uh, you know, deserving of. So it's a it's a really good opportunity in the midst of a very bureaucratic system to put more power and agency in the hands of the families. And I hope, you know, one of the key takeaways is is that people see that you know we're trying to respond to 
what those challenges look like and give better tools and resources to to the families to to make use of. So that's that's really, I mean, Jess and I are both, I mean, I came up through economic empowerment, so I'm I'm sort of a nerd about these things and I get really excited. Um, but you know, as as we continue to to, to develop and, and be responsive to our clients' needs, this is a really great opportunity. And so I hope if anybody is you know, an ESL tutor or a family mentor or just in the community and, and you know, in, in these spaces where where, where families uh, have these needs uh, to definitely reach out to us. Um, and, you know, we're excited to put, you know, time and energy and resources into this so that clients can go from this, you know, I'm getting by, you know, the, the fire is put out, my family's here, we're safe, that's great. But, you know, how, you know, these families have so, you know, they deserve so much more than that and have so much more potential to be, you know, uh, in the same spaces that we are professionally and uh, academically, et cetera. So let's, let's all sort of work together to, to get them there. Right. So that's, that's the exciting opportunity. So, um, if anybody has any questions, definitely reach out to Jess or myself, take a look at the referral form. Uh, if you have any questions on the, on, on any of the information, definitely reach out to us. We can clarify. Um, if you have somebody, you're not really sure they're here this is their background reach out to us i would much rather have the conversation and try to pull them into the program than to exclude anybody unnecessarily so yeah awesome justin thank you so much just this has been really amazing to see the work that you are doing and the way that you've laid it out for us here so and especially to be thinking about your 2023 goals and and how hopeful those feel right now so thank you all um for folks and maybe if we can stick like a round of applause thank yous in the chat we've got i i felt like i was my um confetti little confetti maker was going quite a bit earlier for some of this too um for those of you who are joining us for later sessions today um, it looks like our next session is going to begin at 11 so we have a little bit of a break now um, and then i especially want to encourage folks to tune in come back for uh, the noon roundtable discussion with um, some uh, newcomers who are really uh, have done a lot of careful thinking about how to share some of their experiences so i think we're set up for a really amazing afternoon of programming um, and coming off the morning that has just been really um, just exuberant. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, and we'll see you back here at 11. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Katie. <laughs>